Yeah. Okay, well, you're all very welcome um, to the James Conley Festival Week. Uh, I have to say, I've been listening about James Conley and his songs, Rebel songs for years. My parents have been a very strong supporter. But I only found out today he actually was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, so you learn something new every day. Uh, this is the new tier at your house, and this is the Traveller Culture Week, and you're all very welcome. Just to say, I always want to do this, pretend I'm on a plane. Exits to the yeah, the left. <laughs> Exit to the right. Over there. <laughs> uh, put down the oxygen mask. <laughs> if you feel like that, any the burn is getting to it, take a shoe off and throw it. <laughs> um, but you're all very welcome. Um, my name is Margaret O'Leary. I am um, work. I'm a travel activist first and foremost, but I also work in Southside Travellers Action Group. And it's only to an event I was here a few weeks ago with Rosalind McDonough's book called Unsettled. And then I got to know Aaron and this wonderful teacher and we started talking about bits and bobs and he asked me what I'd like to be involved in this event and she know me and Geraldine Dunn was there at the time and I said of course I would. Um, and of course get Bernard Sweeney along also from Trav Vision. Um, so I said I would participate. My organisation, well should I say our organisation, runs various lot of programmes to support the travelling community. Um, primary healthcare programme, uh, CE programme, community employment that engages with long time unemployment to engage back in employment. We have the youth projects for the, all the travelling kids in the Dunley Rat Down area. Uh, we have the men's shed. We have the task. the task programme, which is like a youth beach programme that people that have left school for whatever reasons come back and get their Due, uh, their leaving service, apologies. Now our organisation and of course everyone for the last couple of years have gone through an awful lot of trials and tribulations during COVID pandemic and I have to say that our organisation and, and including an awful lot of traveller organisations, quite an awful lot of people were saying you haven't been working, you're working from home, we have been steadfast working right through the pandemic to make sure that various information got out to the various sites and in the areas and I'm sure Max Casey who will also be here will vouch for that um, our travel culture is very important to us. We uh, love it. I love my culture. Don't get me wrong. If I started about, as my mother called it this morning, our upside down community, particularly when it comes to the women and uh, the rights of women in our community, can be challenging. But I am passionate about my community, and I'm delighted to be here. And as I said, we were just singing. That's one of my songs I always go to. Is James Connolly song. <laughs> I can't go down certain places because I. Would you like to have a few notes? Never gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, she will. I do. The James Connolly family church. Show in a second. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then Max Casey should be here. She's fashion related. She's from the. She's represented. She wears an awful lot of hats. No more. So than myself. So she can introduce herself when she comes in. Then we have Bernard Sweeney from Travision, and as I just told him, I'm chairing the event. So I don't want to have to tell him twice <laughs> to be quiet, <laughs> and that's just the way it is. Particularly, he's a, he's a male, and at the minute I'm having a thing with the traveller males within my community. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to. We we'll always have to find a balance. Yes, we do indeed. Um, so I'll leave it to you. Bernie. Yeah, I don't wear that many hats at all. Um, I started up a company called Trav Vision Foundation, and one of the reasons was because I spent 20 years fighting with travel organisations. Unfortunately. Uh, when I was much younger, I think I was about five or six years old, when I was in the Neil and Ballarope, County Mayo, I went to the school and looked like, it looked massive, and there was a teacher and she was seven foot four, but of course I was only five years old, so she looked that. But um, I went in there and I was only a few years afterwards and I watched a movie called The Children of the Dam, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Christopher Reeve, I think was in it, these children were possessed with alien life form or something. But in there, they looked like aliens. Um, and not reflecting on the state I must have been in, but they looked so shiny and spotless in their suits, and they all walked together and marched together and scared the shit out of me. Um, the next school I went on to that was the first book I picked up was Anne and Barry. And I was like, okay, Anne and Barry in a tricycle, two story house things, there's a cars. So I ran to the shelf and got Anne and Barry volume two. That was much the same thing, I went to the volume seven or eight, and I said, like, fuck Anne and Barry. There's nothing in here about my culture. There's no, nothing, literally bricks, bricks and mortar. So I was troubled because, well, according to the school, I had uh, difficulties learning, so they put me into this classroom and kept me at the back of the classroom for, I think, four or five years. So the school period was in a classroom where I didn't particularly learn anything. 
So I guess my mind operated slightly different to that of a person that would have been taught or disciplined or had information deposited into their heads. So I grew up kind of quite troubled. Um, I didn't have no qualifications, I had no formal qualifications. So I wished my time away at school. Then I got a bit older and I was involved with Traveller culture. Um, when I say involved, I was in the middle of conflict fights and trying to kill other travellers because <laughs> it was quite normal. <laughs> um, I remember reading an article of cousins of my own to were up in court and the judge demanded, what is causing this row and this friction? So the solicitor talked to the families and he came back and he said, Your Honour, such a family said it started 800 years ago. So you can see the tradition, the culture. Hello, Max. Hi, I'm really sorry I'm late. No, you're okay. I was just telling Rick lies. Um, <laughs> but basically, I went through life like that. No formal qualifications. Uh, had a strong cultural sense. Uh, we had our kings, our queens, our leaders, our chieftains. This is in my lifetime. So some of it bonkers in some cases where it's like something out of a Braveheart movie. But these were really things to us. We grew up with them. Our king and queen were our parents. That was a given. Our grand uncle was our king. But in each clan, whether it be Sweeney, Ward, McDonald, Riley, so on and so forth, all had the same structures. This is why we probably ended up with issues. And Geraldine also. I'm waiting at night, sorry. All right, I just wanted some attention, so. <laughs> <laughs> I do uh, that too. <laughs> so yeah, I went through that period, but I remember thinking when I was quite young that this world is starting to fall down around us. There were actually people were starting to turn on each other, or falling in on each other. And I couldn't understand it, so I thought I'd step away and go and find out what was going on in the settled world, what was causing this. So I got involved with a couple of tribal organisations, helped fund it, some of them, are funded, founded. And then I was there for a short while. I had all these flashbacks because you don't get away that negativity when the teacher tells you you're not going anywhere in life, mm-hmm. that you're going to be dealing with horses and scrap if you're lucky. And then we go to pubs, shops, and all this rejection, rejection, rejection. It was almost atmospheric. In any town, any village, any place, you could sense it, you could feel it, and you were constantly on a high alert with your brain. Yeah. You were thinking about things around the corner, thinking of things that might go wrong, things that you might have to say, so on and so forth. So it was a lifelong of that. So I was quite troubled before I even came to the NGOs. But I was in the NGOs a couple of years and I, I was getting frustrated because everybody wanted you to sit down and do a programme or tell you to go to school or go back to college. And that was all fine and well, but the way I was looking at it, all these people were educated people. They had all degrees and PhDs and they were professors and they were geniuses if you listen long enough to them. But that was no good to travellers. And if they couldn't do with their education, why different with us taking up the same programmes that they have received, how would that help us? So I said to some of the travellers, I said, I think this middle class, no disrespect to anyone here in the middle class, we can go into that later on, mm-hmm. but I assumed that there was something up with the middle class. Maybe they had spent so long in the systems uh, since young people, it would make sense. Because if you rewind it a bit and look at this, what we call Irish education, it isn't Irish education, it's still old English colonial education, Trinity College, Minute College, King's Inn Court, Royal College of Surgeons, all of these are English, they're never changed. So this was the clash we were having, I started to figure out, that our culture, mentality and mindset was in connecting with this settled environment. And when I say settled, I don't want to call it a divide to travellers and the settled. This is human beings. These two labels were born out of colonisation. And um, we go back further, they called us tinkers, they called us itinerants, they called us vagrants, they called us wood people, box people, yeah. uh, right into Irish clans, into the Gaelic society. So all up to the NGOs, I said, look, I think you guys are actually interfering with our well-being, our mental well-being. We cannot be doing the things you want us to do, or else we won't be ourselves by the end of it. So I had a protest in Casabar, I think you were in there. Yeah. Like, whew. Anyhow, I, I said, our nine to five friends are oppressing us. Um, almost paid protesters and stuff like that. It sounded like in one way I was angry, but I was angry. I, was, I wasn't really tuned into the education this time. So I was uh, inspired a lot by Malcolm X, yeah. the white liberals and all the early good for us talking, nothing ever changes. And all this was flashing through me. But instead, I thought I'd get a kind of, uh, that makes sense, and, like all the shutters came down. The local organisation contacted the national organisations and they had these meetings. Before you knew it, I became the villain. I was radical. <laughs> I was anti-settled. I was anti-NGO. When they were calling me radical and stuff like that, I was delighted. I was, oh yeah, keep it coming. Um, but that did me no good because now I was even further excluded than ever had been in my life. Yeah. So unfortunately, wishing my life away as a child in the education system to a teenage life being rejected and feeling othered 
to this life where the only opportunity we have to change this might have to come through NGOs because they had all the connections. They were connected to the schools, the universities. But unfortunately, that came down. I went through a number of years, the best part of 20 years, seriously messed up because what I wanted is I wanted it out of my mind. I wanted to be done with it. You can't handle it no more. You don't know where to go with it. You don't know who to talk about it. I was like walking up inside, or waking up inside the matrix. It's like everybody's going on about your business. And I was trying to usher this kind of settled mentality is doing something to us and so on and so forth. So I scared a lot of people. I ended up in a life of pretty much homeless, broken down marriage, drug issues, addiction issues. And all of this wasn't because I was a broken person. Because I remember when I was a very not broken person, a very proud young traveller, and um, earmarked for to be our chieftain, stuff like that. But now I couldn't go back to my own community, and I couldn't go to the settlement community, I couldn't go to the travellers and the NGOs. I was literally gone. So I started wishing my life away. So years had passed, and a documentary had popped up, and it was uh, on the documentary of the genetics of Irish travellers. Right. So they were saying that travellers diverged, and all their narrative was wrong, but I already knew yeah. that. They were saying that travellers had diverged from the settled community 360 years ago and all about genetics and so on and so forth. But then I started thinking, thinking, thinking about it because I already knew we grew up proud and we already talked about kings and chieftains <clears throat> and all this kind of stuff. We had a sense of our history but it was being denied. It was like, no you're not, you're gypsies, you're Roma. I came up to Dublin years ago and I was told to F back to my own country. Yeah. Which later on I figured out that would make sense because Dublin was still English pale. So <laughs> Spike was a long way away. But um, those things started to rub off me a lot. Um, so yeah, I think I got to a pay stage then where I said, look, at, we need to look at this. We need to address this because there's travellers, literally children now taking their lives. And no matter how much investment, it's not because we have an evil government or we've got bad politicians or in this term we call racism. Which, it was yeah. something else. It was just completely at loggerheads with everything we do. We were uttered. But I didn't realise when I looked into it further, the divergence, they said we came from the settled population 360 years ago, which was bullshit. Because 360 years ago was the Elizabethan conquest. There wasn't a settled population. There was a Gaelic society up to that point. So that's where we came from, a Gaelic society, not a, a settled environment. The settled environment was conjured up a, by the English. This was a, I mean, they called it the act of settlement, act of, settlement of Ireland and so on and so forth. I mean, the whole idea was to change the narrative of Ireland completely. And they started off in the Pale a thousand years ago, they built it up. They expanded to the four shires, which was the four counties around that. Then they set up their local authorities in all the other counties, so they are feeding and pumping this information, this new identity. And over the hundreds of years, what once was Gales came to surrender and regrant by Henry VIII. So that's something quite a few done. When he had enough of the men, they brought out the Vagrancy Act. Now, Again, when I was getting called radical and militant and stuff like this, which I was loving, but I wasn't getting paid for it, so that was no good. But with the English were now hunting down these people in the Gaelic society. And some of the things they had on their act, which was hilarious, one was people going around selling knowledge. Brilliant. People who said they were gentry and to work with Benito. People who had fantastical imaginations. And um, again, how would anyone think they were insults? Mm -hmm. uh, these were the English acts and laws. So the vagrancy was an English concept. Tinker, traveller, all these labels settled came from an English concept. Yeah. We would say we're, all the human beings on the planet are 99.9% .9 genetically related. So the only thing that separates us is, is psychology. Culture and just that sorry, because sorry. Culture and all that, and as I said, because you would, and I'm you know, I'll, 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 I'll get one <laughs> here forever, and all that. Goes, and all that, and we're here, we want questions and answers because we want people to learn and ask us questions about the culture. I mean, go all that, and um, I listen to you all day, and you're fascinated about the history of stuff. But can you give us a little bit of thing about your trap vision? Yeah, no, and give us a bit of speed on that. That maybe. was trap vision. No, but yeah. <laughs> back to Henry the Eighth and the whole thing. Oh, yeah, and it's fascinating <laughs> because we need to introduce Max Casey and then. We have to ask for the audience, so, yeah. and I would, and you're fascinating and all that, and uh, I'm not putting it across, <laughs> but can you tell us what, what the trap vision is about? Yeah. We want to promote your trap vision. Yeah. It is, but I also want to hit hard home, yeah. and uh, people feel offended by your classes, and I'll explain where that came from, your working class, middle class elites. Um, sorry, but yeah. it's not the way I want to offend people, piss people you're off. Not, you're just, I want to you're not offending anyone, yeah. you're just, but I'm just saying. Well, that guy up there looks very serious. We need to get, <laughs> we need to get, we need to, what you need to do, you need to, I've had to talk a whole documentary about Elvis in two seconds flat, and I've had to get all this information out. 
Jordan giving that much history and it's brilliant, fantastic yeah. and all that. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me a little bit about travel vision because travel vision you're here to represent and you want to promote it. You just got sanctioned today as an ent- as a charter thing and you just... Red shirt as an Red shirt as a... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, <laughs> and just there's a, just a, a love hate. I know I know Bernard a long time, like I can always, and we always have the and we 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 could often make for ten minutes and I could go with the hour for conversations and he's brilliant and I'm always fascinated about him. Bernard was seen as a little bit as an outcast because he challenged yeah. an awful lot of things that went on within the community, which he did in fair play to right. And whatever he said, no, he did, and he is right, is about coming back into our community. What was our obstacles in the community and what happens with the government and what happens with an awful lot of people that are getting funded in the countries. It's like when you have something, they're not going to pay you to fight against yeah. their service that they're giving you and bad mouth and things like that. Right. Bernard came along then, rightly so, and, the whole, and he challenged an awful lot of things and, and no harm in that. And his story resonates an awful lot of myself and yeah. Max and any traveller out there, anyone from different mm-hmm. minority groups, 100%. Then he came along and had the brilliant idea of setting up an independent trap vision to get exactly them stories that you have yes. there that's right across the country out to an independent forum without being funded by the government so that we can have no filters because if you're running any kind of programs and you're getting funded by certain governments you have to be or oh, you can't say this you can't say that so we're all here to represent the likes of james Connolly, the likes of the people back in the day that they did not want to be filtered by the government he had a brilliant idea of setting this up that he can go and he's hoping to get podcasts set up to run to talk about exactly what is the oppression within our community as we have but also why is our community facing the realities that we already have so yeah for me trap vision it was based on all, pretty much what i told you uh, my life experiences and it was trying to connect with people outside of colonial labels just for a few moments everybody can go back to their business and do what they're doing again. so looking at arts uh, documentaries films um, stories and so on support it isn't anti-English, it isn't anti-Protestant, it isn't anti-Catholic or anyone else because we come from a culture where we are quite forgiving regardless of what's put in front of us. Mm-hmm. And if we lose something, we respect it and we accept it to a great degree. Um, so we don't have that kind of vengeance or spitefulness in us. Like, you've been involved a long time. I think there was tens and tens of thousands spent within NGOs on reports yeah. to tell travellers how settled people feel about them. As if we needed any reminding how settled people felt about us. But you've never seen a report ever where travellers were asked, how do you feel about settled people? Because it isn't there. There isn't that feminist or anger. But I cannot blame settled people either. Because how are they meant to know they grew up in a colony that was unchanged in 1922? Nobody knew this. A lot of people here, I'm sure, never even thought about this before. Like, we're using somebody else's language in a country that's meant to be ours. Uh, we're using the same institutions that were designed to oppress us in the first place and destroy us. So Travision is based around cultural healing and also what's, what's magnificent about all this, I think, um, everyone sees travellers as the 0.7% of the general population, this ethnic minority. But we were once actually the majority of this island because we're talking about culture and mentality. It's nothing to do with genetics, it's cultural mentality. Also, when you look at what happened here in Ireland over the hundreds of years of um, English oppression, they experimented on Irish for centuries, long before they went to the Americas, long before they went to the West West Indies and other places. So if you look at America, uh, the Virginia Company, which is the brains behind America, that was pretty much developed in Ireland. The West Indies developed in Ireland. Some of the Jamaican laws were designed here in Ireland against the Irish and brought to Jamaica. So we have a, a global connection. Now, if you want to take travel statistics and health, put them to one side, look at Native Americans, look at African Americans, look at the first Natives of Canada, Australia, Maori, uh, Sami, all have the same issues, all the same outcomes. So it didn't take a whole lot of thinking to figure out we have one thing, one common denominator, and that is a Western colonial system. Because a lot of people forget that Ireland was not part of Europe. It wasn't a feudal system. It was an honour-based system, where England and the rest of Europe was a feudal system. That was so much me talking about Travision, I just can't stop with the history. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it gives me a sense that I'm, uh, with Travision, that, that these ideas are there, and they're not hostile to anyone. Because at this present moment, we're dropping dead. Like this, we're the worst statistics of any community in Europe. But yet, we have some of the physically strongest people on the planet. We've got a... Uh, athletes right across the board, male and female. So we have a healthy people, but psychologically we are getting destroyed. 
And we did not have these psychological issues till 1960s when the government sure. started their own little colonisation project where the other travellers segregated home, beat, slapped, killed, raped children. Uh, cut everybody off from the public domain. So when you see what happened to Native Americans and their homes, that happened to travellers right up to the 60s, 70s and the 80s and 90s. So all of these were in, almost done in the plain view of the eyes of the nation. Because the majority had no reason to think, I think even, you know, the older travellers would have told me, you know, they didn't study back to the extent that you would have studied. But in terms of, you know, my father would have always said, when Cromwell came in, that's where the divide was. You know, that's where we struggled, yeah. the musicians and the priests, and that's where the word, sorry to insult certain people, but the word buffer came, you know, because we, at, the, at that particular time, that was a turning point. Yeah. Uh, the travellers would have, you know, smuggled priests around Ireland, and then the divide tends for our land and stuff like you that. You know where their class system came from around the same time, 1620, I think it was. They bought into the system, right? Because 1530s, I think, they already had done the surrender and grants. In other yeah. words, if all the Gales were to surrender to an English, English monarch, whatever it was, the system, laws, traditions, language, yeah. cut their hair, wear English clothes. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? So they went in there, but three generations later, they brought in the, uh, almost a, a classism. So at the very top you had the gentleman Irish and the gentlewoman Irish. And then beneath that you had the civil Irish. And then beneath that you had the wild Irish. So this was the new English colonial class system. Now if you forward that today, you can say that's the elites, the middle class and the working class. So the working class would have been once the wild Irish. Now that's 390 years of a system that a lot of people do not understand. This is why you have these conflicts within the settled community between the working class, the middle class and the elites. Everybody's blaming each other. Everybody wants to destroy the systems. But what they don't understand is that they are the systems. They are a product of the systems. And you cannot change no systems unless you change the mentality. Yeah. Just to uh, say thank you very much for that, Bernard, and brilliant. And just, Mags, if you want to introduce yourself. <laughs> and, and just say, even myself, as a, as a traveller woman and a traveller activist, I would sit down and listen to these two people yeah. all day, and I get in trouble. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, so... And I, I know all this, but I just, I always, I would listen, but I'm just conscious that the audience might know who Mags, I know yeah. Mags, um, went back, so introduce yourself. I don't know what you're here to represent as a travel woman or you're just here as a as mental health or <laughs> he was giving you a speed there a minute ago, but you could speak um, for yourself, I'm sure. <laughs> I suppose I'm Max Casey and um, I run a, lo- a local NGO. Um, it just what Bernard was saying around um, the NGOs are very structured in terms of uh, ticking boxes key performance indicators and I suppose uh, we're funded um, to mimic the establishment um, so what I try to do and there's a couple of people like me across Ireland that are running NGOs what we try to do is we tick the, in the state boxes but what we try to do is create political change within, within our own community and I suppose I would have been involved in setting up um, a campaign called um, the National Travel Mental Health Campaign and that would be to look at the root causes of the high suicide rates within the travel community. I uh, would have been involved in other things but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm just going to try and focus on class division and the political side of it. I think um, the high suicide rates is a political issue for the travel community uh, because um, it's an awful indictment when our community don't understand uh, internalised oppression and where it's coming from in terms of institutional racism and discrimination. Unfortunately, last week I had very an aunt of mine, 66 years of age, and everybody just thought she took her own life. She died through suicide because of the injustice that we face in Irish society, and it just becomes a, a statistic. Mm. And the real reality of it is, as a community, we're no longer fractured. We're actually shattered as a community. And James Connolly, he had a quote, and he said, "Don't be practical in politics. To be practical, to be practical in a sense, 
means that you have schooled yourself to think along the lines and the grooms that those who have robbed you want, would, desire you to think so. And that's unfortunate, that's his code. And that's actually happened constantly in terms of class division. Like, you know, coming from the Traveller community, it's very easy to be practical uh, for the Irish ruling regime. If your traveller means going along with the flow for generations, and understanding, not understanding, the oppression that we face in Irish society. And the constant message that has been sent to our young people, and Bernard talked about his experience of being in the education system. You know, Bernard's story is not unique. This, many of the travellers have that story. I have a story where I was power host um, and many of the travellers of my age actually were physically, you know where um, the fire brigade actually has a power hose to, power, to quench a fire, that's what happened to us as, as young travellers at a particular time. And I think what Bernice said, since 1963, um, being absorbed, you know, the Taoiseach at the time, Charlie Hawley, or was he the Minister for Justice at the time? He was saying, you know, that he wanted travellers absorbed and um, assimilated. And unfortunately, I think they have achieved their objective. But in the meantime, they've actually killed us. We're dying. You know, each time that we even speak or get together, unfortunately, we have young people and people in our community dying through suicide. And the reason is because they don't feel any self-worth, they don't feel part of Irish society. Where we actually live in Irish society, we're hidden behind walls, big grey walls, out of sight and out of mind. Now, I know Irish and Irish society, there was a history where women were condemned and put in to the, the laundry institutions. It's actually a crime to be gay and lesbian in this country. I think it's about time now that we talk about the injustice that's happened to the Charlotte community in Irish society. And um, I think we deserve an apology. And I think it's a political issue and I think we can't do it on our own. We shouldn't be expected to do it on our own. We actually need allies. We need settled allies to support us and challenge the political parties of what's happening to us. I, if we look at travel statistics, like one of the statistics is 84% of the community are unemployed. That's no accident. That's not an accident. A lot of our young people are actually dying through suicide and state neglect. We need to look at state neglect in terms of the negligence uh, that has happened to us as a community and is continuously happening to us. I actually met a civil rights activist in Belfast before Christmas and her name is Bernadette Devlin and um, she was trying to encourage this travel boy to stay in school and um, she said I was so disappointed she said man that I kept asking him to stay in school all the time and the reason why he said Bernadette you don't understand what they're doing to me he said I feel like a piece of scum a piece of dirt I feel like worthless they said, the sooner I get out of here, the better. Any old kids that do survive in the education system, they have to deny who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, that in itself says a lot. I mean, there's a there's a wide perception that if you have an education in this country, you can go far right across this whole part of this world, actually. But if you're a traveller child and you go through the school systems and go through primary school and do what they do, tell you in school and tick all the boxes and they go do your juniors that leave and start and go to college and all that you get treated with respect mm -hmm. and that's all that's going to get you treated with respect in this country education well I can tell you firsthand that does not work I've always been a fighter of education I left school at 14 years of age as a typical traveller at the time but I got some of my school in, in Ireland primary school in a school in Tallaght actually 
and my parents would not have a uh, travel only school, so I went to a settled school. I hated it, but I didn't hate being in the school. I just wanted to be with all my cousins and all my, yeah. where the crack would be, the bus would come around the section. My mother was like, no, you're going to go, I'm going to get proper education. Mm. Then we moved to the UK and we went to school in the UK for a few years. And the only thing I got discriminated against in school in the UK was because I was a red Irish. And then I used to tell everyone that Jerry Allen was my uncle. And in the middle of, oh yeah, I was a, I was a rebel. And because, you know, you get bullied in school. It wasn't because I was a traveller, it was because I was Irish. I had red hair and freckles. I had bright red hair at the time. My hair's gone darker. And then to pee him off, I'd say, and a bad time when you think about child innocence, there'd be troubles going on in the UK at that time, and bombs and all. And I'd be like, Jerry Adams is my uncle, and all this. And, and it's only when I came back to this country at 16 years old, I'll never forget it. And I went to a McDonald's, a local McDonald's where my family would be from originally. And I remember there was a group of us coming down, my cousins and my aunts and all that. And there was a group of settled teenagers, as you do, in McDonald's. And I was standing there, and my, me and my sister would be having grown up with different educations. So what, our family would have in this country. Like my mother met us sure that we watched Roots and we knew who Martin Luther King was. Yeah. We knew who, uh, all about the, the political things going on in the world and the injustice going on in the world and yeah. all about the um, Helen Keller and all that. So I, we were very affronted. And, but I remember going to this McDonald's and it was locally opened. And I remember the manager came up behind the desk and he said, uh, now at the time I was at the Nights about my age in school, not in school but in UK. I left school at 14 and I got a job in an establishment in the UK. I get the wrong age and I was, came up to the ranks barely quick enough and I was only 16. And I came back to this McDonald's and he said, you have to leave here now. Get out of here. To me and my aunts and my cousins. And I was like, what, what's, what's going on here? Like, with a little posh English accent with me. At the time I could do a real posh English accent. And he said, you're not getting served here. He said, there's too many teenagers here. And he's knackered and he always used the word as being said, you're not getting served. What yet? I was like affronted and I was like, how dare you? But oh my, my aunts and my cousins were that used to it. They didn't see any injustice in this. Right. They turned under heat and walked out. And me and my sister was there, Giovanna, and we were doing a protest there and then. I was like, you will not <laughs> put me out. Them children, they're going out there and all that. Mm-hmm. But it was just, it was only years after I realised the people, the children that was grew up in this country as travellers were used to and, it. And I think you're right. And okay. accepted it. I did not accept it. And I told the manager, I said, you know something, I said, we're moving back here. I'm getting a job in this McDonald's, he told me. <laughs> and only told me, you will never get a job in this McDonald's, he said. I swear this is the truth. And I came back and they were calling for staff and it was right on top for a site. And I went in and got an interview and the whole lot, but they asked for reference where I was working. And the very words the guy in the UK sent the back, he said, if you don't hire this girl, he said, you will be losing a job here, he said. So I got hired in this and I don't doubt at him anyway, probably tons up to him. And I worked there for about two years after. But that was just, and no matter how much, but it's just, it was a difference that the, the empower, I felt indifferent because, I felt power because I knew this was wrong. But if you grew up in the whole system and that you're not worthy in the whole lot, but anyhow, I could go on forever and ever and ever those stories. I, we're gonna do questions and answers in a minute, but I've been kindly asked to ask everyone, we're gonna do donations for this theater, lovely theater, because this is a free event. And if you can, deep in your pockets, um, those and give out to be brilliant. But also, I just want to ask, and this is a question I want to ask the audience. Mind if I just finish with just something that I just want to say? Oh, yes, of course you can. I just think it's really important that we understand as a community, we live with just what Margaret said, we live with anticipated anxiety because of the prejudice and racism that we face every day. And the statistics says it all for itself. In terms of window dressing, Bernard just talked about it. In terms of state policy, it talks about implementation and it set up all these NGOs that um, to actually keep us busy in working in the NGOs, taking boxes, key performance indicators and now I think the vast majority of travellers know that the empire has no clothes. Now some people in the NGO sector is still prepared to go on and work in that regime and uh, that's different decisions for different people. But I think people, there's lots of people, very good people in the NGO sector uh, are there, but they know, and they have a conscience, and they can't sleep at night, and they know that it's actually wrong, and it is, there's an investment in, in the NGO sector to actually play along with the, the government, to actually, they're actually 
for want of a better word, we're actually dying because of the NGO structures, because it's funded, because it looks as it is. You're not giving choices, you're giving no, decisions. No, we're not giving me. choices. We're actually giving design decisions. programs to continuously oppress our community. And it's like a, a machinery, a business that is constantly going around and around in circles. And I just want to bring you back to the point why I set up the National Travel Mental Health Campaign. Because in 2010, the figure was seven times higher than the national average uh, in Irish society. I can tell you that it's probably tripled in that. Bernard, Margaret, Geraldine can tell you, lots of other travellers uh, can tell you that that has actually tripled. And they don't want to go near that, that particular, they don't want to do that research again. Because every, every tree needs to know its roots. And I think, you know, Bernard talking about historically where we came from, that's going to be very good for the next generation. A lot of damage has been done to my age group, you know, so, so, so we're trying to... The strange thing is that when we talk about this historical events, people think that we want to live in the past. No, we don't. But we're saying, no, we're in the here and the now. Mm. It is the settled people who are living in the past, it's yeah. the settled people using the same old English colonial systems. Yeah. So and like, anyone living in the past, but it's like, e Even if you look at the homeless crisis that we have in Irish society, I mean, if I come out and I speak about, you know, this actually is, that's a business, it's an industry. And that, that issue of homelessness could have been sorted mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, but they decided not to. And the privilege in Irish society actually closed their eyes to that particular issue no more than what's happening to travellers in Irish society. You don't like and what's left in the Ukraine, as you know and I know, it probably would happen to us. And I would be called racist for saying this, but Roma, Really, Roma gypsies is left in the Ukraine and people who come from extreme poverty. So, if there was a war in this country right now, travellers would be left here and people would be left coming from a deprived <laughs> area, <laughs> from <laughs> deprivation. Yeah. So, we need to call it for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, we have a two tier system. We have one Ireland, but we have two, we've, we have people living in, in such an unequal. Irish society and um, we don't seem to combine together and people think that's none of their business what actually happens to travellers or something. You know the sad thing about long is that the Irish travellers were the first people to go up against the English, whether it be the Gallant Glass, the Cairn, Irish clans, all these names that we came from and all the practices we've been doing for hundreds of years are still with us. Yeah. That's why every when we see it now it just falls into place. But if you reflect it, because it's like a colonial optical illusion. Do you ever see these optical illusions where it looks like a rabbit one way and then it looks like a duck? Well, it's pretty much like that. If you become so accustomed to seeing the images that you projected around you and the systems, it becomes very yeah. normalised. But travellers don't see the same way. No. So we are the ones that end up getting pushed. We were kept away from the settled community. We were excluded, but the settled population was impoverished. Now you'll know this. If you go to a settled community, look around Ireland. Do you see any history, any Gaelic movies, any literature really shown its way? As far as the settled people can go back is to the famine. That yeah. is literally, and everything is bleak and miserable and dark and you wouldn't want to go back there. No. Nothing about the thousands of years of wealth of culture from the Irish monks who taught the English how to read and write. Also, now, what um, just in words. touch with that, and I, will have, I always say this about my community, I have a few things that would be that pee me off my community sometimes and that, and as any community, especially as a woman anyhow. Yeah. Don't get me started on being a woman in the traveling community. <laughs> don't think there's no rules, you're, only, you're supposed to guess all that. But one thing I will say, we have kept an awful lot of culture alive in this country. Yeah, yeah. My child, God bless all my children, my three sons and my young, my youngest girl is 10, got about one little girl, and she knows the gammon proper Irish school language back from the day. Mm. She knows all the old singers. She'd be able to know exactly some of the rebel songs, she'd be able to hum along to it. Yeah. That there's an awful lot of children out there from the settled communities and schools wouldn't have a clue. We have an awful thing with musicians, yeah. uh, the likes of Pecker Dunn and all that, the, the fiddlers, the accordions, um, and it, it, we don't have to go to school about it. We learn yeah. it. If you, anyone has ever gone to a traveller's wedding, that you'll never forget a traveller's wedding. I know people sometimes highlight, you've never, you never, there's that much, like the, the accordions are coming out. The, the Irish dancing shoes are coming out. It's like going back in the day when it's like, you know, the, 
the Titanic force then kind of thing, we're all down having the hooli down singing, you're singing and you're all melodramatic and all that. That's the way our culture is, and we're so passionate about our culture. Like my, there's not many children out there who know who Philly Wells is, or who Patsy Klein is, or who right. even Marty Robbins is, and the Sam Cooks or the the Jim Reeves and all that. But all of our children would know exactly who all them singers are, alongside the modern singers up there, and they have to know all the old songs and the old language that we do, and we do keep that very much alive, and even the fiddlers, mm-hmm. and the old Cayley music, as they call it, mm-hmm. they know all these rebel songs and a heartbeat second, and they better sing them and write poetry and all that. Um, I know that the guys, we need to get questions and answers because we need to wear talking, and we will talk, we wouldn't have three better people to talk. But I want to ask a question to the audience, if you don't mind me asking you a question. And as I said, bring up one of you want. Has any of you ever been in a travel hot inside or good travel families around from this arena. Curiosity. Put your hands up. No shame. Oh, one, two, one, two, three. Okay, I'm curious what you do. <laughs> um, because I'm fascinated with the oldest group within society and the amount of people I've met along my times have never been or have never associated or worked alongside a traveller within the, or even been in a traveller site. Yeah. So, and it's, it's just. We're not expecting everyone to go out there and change the whole perception about travel because it's like me. We have our own prejudice with our own community. This is me you now on the tip of the day. When I'm outside the, in the wide street community, I may fight for travel rights, and then you have to fight for the gay rights, and then you have to fight for the black rights, and then you have to fight for the, immig- the immigration people coming to the country. And then you get exhausted. Do you know, you're like, you're fighting but all, I, I, all I, I everything. Think, I think it's different when it comes to us, you know. I think... Um, How is it? I, I just want to explain. It's, you know, it's very... Um, it's very kind of like if you look at Black Lives Matter and if you look at the middle class in Irish society, uh, they saw it as a very kind of popular and modern thing to be involved in Black Lives Matter. How many times have you seen travellers stand outside the door and it's actually 15, not. 20, 30 people yeah, tops. it's actually not, you know, it's actually not. It's not the thing to be it's associated with travellers. And I remember a politician said to me one time, I said to him, look, I won't name him. I was like, why don't you go on to the sites and why don't you associate with travellers, whatever. And he said, Margaret, he said, I don't go to a particular area either in Limerick. Poverty doesn't look nice. It doesn't smell nice. And it's not nice to be associated with it. So that's my honest answer. And I think when it comes to Black Lives Matter, and I know more than Margaret and know more than Bernard or any of the travellers in the audience, you know, we would have always supported. Injustice was injustice, and it was simple as that. But what I found, for me, on a personal level, I can't speak for everybody, I just found it really, really um, being set people being hypocrites when it came to looking at injustice sword, people. because of their own indigenous people were dying in front of them and they were treated in every sector of institutional racism and prejudice See, well, or whatever but and they always say we're sick of you whinging mm-hmm. and i do hear that i do hear settled people because the best of my friends are settled people but and, and the NGOs didn't come forward with solutions either. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. But we have solutions as a community. Like you've set up your own you know, a, a media company now that you always say it's not about IMAX, it's about we. And um, I have solutions in terms of education. I know you have, Jared, and I know all the chaps have, you know, in terms of the enterprise and the economy and uh, around even uh, travel accommodation. Like for example, people automatically think that we wanted concentration camps. We didn't. That's what Hawthorne sites are, is concentration. I call them open prisons, like Shatton Abbey. You can leave like, them whatever, you come back at some stage. And whatever we were looking at, it's actually genocide happening in this country to travellers. And the statistics will prove that. That's scientifically Not even just the statistics, but the history. Yeah. The history on this island, there were several genocides on this island. It wasn't just one genocide. You're never going to get any questions, I know he's going to say. I'm actually, I'm actually, give me, give me two sure. seconds to go to you. All right, no, 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 Okay. But I want to say one more thing if I may. I think it's important. I think it's important. Right? Um, two things. Why we're talking? You, you, I'm going to give you one thing. All right. All right. Well, and you're going to respect me as a chair. Can't spend seven minutes telling me to talk for one minute. 
<laughs> it, there's, um, there's two things to keep in mind, and this way it, it might help people to come away from the settle and travel mentalities, yeah. is that we don't mm-hmm. see settled people as one community. Like there's the west of Ireland, I would call Irish settled. Yeah. There are settled people who came from the English background, the English pale, and they would be settled Irish. Oh. And we would be outside it again. But it's not because we're genetically different or unrelated to people. It's mm. we're psychologically more aligned by keeping the traveller language that kept us linked to that history. The other thing I would say to you when I talk about it, the genocide. Yeah. 1600s and the present day, right there, that's your time spectrum. Yeah. In the 1600s, Trinity College, Manute College, King's Inn Court, all of the institutions went up there and throughout the centuries have been attacking wild Irish, Gales, now right down to what we call travellers. The once Irish people who became part of the Surrender Regrant were reprogrammed into an English way of thinking. So their children, generation and generation after that, became more English. Yeah. But they never taught that. They always believed themselves to be the default Irish. And why would they think any different? Mm-hmm. So where's that with a genocide? Yeah. Here's the local authorities that pulse funding, that yeah. was allocated for accommodation. If that wasn't bad enough, here comes the state H- HSE, the National yeah. Health Board, pulling funding for to, save, to save people from chronic issues, psychological issues. So left, right and centre we get destroyed. Yeah. One last thing I'll say, on the James Connolly Festival, we're talking about Black Lives Matter and sometimes oh, we, we're almost sitting back watching a different channel yeah. in our own country. Mm-hmm. So we, yeah. we don't feel part of this country. No. So when we see the middle classes, even in the festival, and they were talking about the rise of the far right and the rise of racism, yeah. we're saying, like, what the fuck, man? A hundred years of kidnapping children and beating them oh. in segregated home, institutional, concentration camps, behind walls, in dumps, behind power lines, humiliated, Another altered, male, like, yeah, destroyed. Yeah, we're right. like walking zombies in our own country. Any traveller ever went to England, did far well, better psychologically uh, than they did the Irish travellers in the wrong country. I rest my case. Yeah, yeah, she's a <laughs> prime example. <laughs> just, just, yeah. uh, um, just to say, and I will say something about the history, and you're right, anyone, it all depends who writes the history. It's like yeah, even back, you go back any right. times, but who it writes through. history. Because <laughs> in the Western world, is it the right to write history, the Seuss, what goes on in the Eastern yeah. world, and we're, we're a typical sure, example sure, of that. Sure, I break the ice and just from the audience. Ask a question, ask questions. If you're up on the stage, I swear you'll shame us. I know I will. Can I just say, right, I'm looking up at James Connolly, right, and Bernie, you, you mind boggle me. I mean, the, the mirror of your knowledge of history, you, you, you draw me in, and I'll never be able to comprehend what you're trying to get out there, but I do, in a way, understand that it's also to do with history. But look at us all here as Irish people. Forget about travellers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm from a settled background, and I integrated into the traveller community. Talk to me about that sometime. But the thing about James Connolly, he fought for freedom. Who yeah. has freedom in this room? Traveller, Irish person, English person, who has freedom no. in this world? None of us. No. Because man that got power, that got colonised, or whatever you want to call it, you can put it into perspective, decided to come together, get power, and put barriers, put borders. But that's what happened in the world you know in to, general. Do you know how to say that we can't find any written history, history of travellers? They didn't leave no history. I'm in the place of wallpaper. Well, now he here, is. James Conley, the 1916, and the guy who died with him, Douglas Hyde, uh, Hugh McNeil, yeah. uh, Plunkett, all of them, including De Valera's wife, was writing poetry and books about the tinker culture. Tay, we were two Adana, we were the ancient tribes of the pre-Celtic people, and they used that throughout the years to cause an uprising, the 1916 yes. uprising, which was based on travel identity and culture. And from then on to this day, thanks to Jim Conley, people who invited us after 105 years, um, <laughs> is that we were whitewashed completely out of that history. Because nobody knows who travellers are. That's and they think we're a group. I've often heard illiterate. the middle class people say to me. That's because they were illiterate. No, it's no. because the state was already inherently English. Okay. Dublin was the pale, the four shires was its protection. It was never going to change system to counter their own mentality. So they pretended they were the Irish, so they created the settled Irish. But did we not all buy into borders and barriers? Well, what do you think? As a whole. Yeah, but yeah, look, yeah, how they not try to hold on to some ethnicity and freedom, and they're still trying to do that? Well, it's so whole, is that the difference between settled? Is that the difference? No. Um, I, I, would s- that. I would say the only difference is psychological, because if you go into the west of Ireland, you're going to find people who are more aligned with traveling into the yeah, culture. Yeah. Look, we got people in the settled community with the same surname, same skin complexion, on the That's same right. island. Now, the modern baby homes, so yeah. just like um, the famine, 
when they broke down the people and they took the children in, well, then they educated them in a different way. So they grew up hating travellers, when most of them actually came from travellers. Yeah. So that's the power of the education. I would say we're still in an ongoing colonisation. There's no such thing as post-colonialism. And James Condy had spotted that back in the day when he talked about the institutions and what they would do if they didn't take down the institutions first. Now people will say, well, James, what James Condy stood for, what James Condy stood for has absolutely nothing to do with what he died for. And what he died for was to apply the principles of a Gaelic culture. And if that had happened, well, we wouldn't be here today suffering, because that Gaelic culture would have protected us. Instead, yeah. it didn't. Thank you, Blessing. Any other questions? And the money thing is going around here, if anyone wants to put money into the thing. <laughs> just say... Uh, what, what Bernard... Uh, sorry, just, sorry, Trudy, there's a question in the back, sorry. What's your name? Sandra. Sandra, hi Sandra. Hi. Um, I'd like to be here tonight, and it's great to hear your perspective on things, and uh, well done to you, your three survivors, and yeah, I'm really, really appreciating your perspective. But what is your vision for the travel community? Me, I know I like my vision. I put it, but I'll say my vision. Your vision. I have a vision that, for example, like I'm a ten year old. I had a vision years ago that we'd all walk through the same life and be together and all that. But I've come to realise in the last few years that I am a traveller. I am a traveller woman. <coughs> my children are travellers, and their identity needs to be given back to them. The state needs to leave us alone, basically, and not try to mould us into them. I want to be free to be able to travel again and to be able to, my children be able to have horses as part of their culture they want. I want them to be able to walk into schools and not be ashamed. The first thing when they get ready to school to, I want them to realise, and we only had a chat with this this morning, that about maths, not about uh, what way am I going to talk now in front of my friends, I have to put a little bit of an accent to me. I want a, a, a thing of my, my people to be proud and stand proud and be able to walk down to any of these streets in Temple Bar and be able to say, I can walk into any of these establishments and be served as an equal person. So I'd be on the forefront of the likes of Matthew the King. I have a dream and I have a vision that all men will stand equal and be treated equal. Just to be, but in my own skin, not have to mould to be different. That's my vision and my dream. And yeah, I feel like crying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that vision to that lady up there. I haven't even yeah. seen her. She hasn't seen my face either. But that vision for me is about us settled people because I'm from the settled community. I remember as well what I just said. And I integrated that and I bred five traveller children, which I'm very proud of. And some went with the traveller culture, some went with the settled culture, and it's brilliant. But my vision is that that lady back there and everybody in the country would stand up for travellers without having to be an obligation or think that they're there or they're not. It's just to say that we welcome that this is a part of our culture and our society and we are delighted to have it because there's great traits. Because I know one thing for me, when I met my other half in the travel community, I definitely came from the settled community saying, I want those traits and I want those traditions. There's something I want to live for. So that's my vision and I got that. Yeah. And I still have that even if it's been a challenge and there's obviously issues with suicide and mental health, there's been some perks, because there's obviously perks in the traveling community. It's a fabulous culture, it's a fabulous traditional culture, it's a, a, a close-knit community, it's lovable, they look out for one another, travelers look out for one another, they're kind to one another in most cases, and there's obviously challenges, but it's a fabulous old-school culture that was maybe shared with the South community many, many months ago. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I think, you know, in terms of, I always say, you know, I always say to the political parties and um, certain people to stop trying to fix us yeah. and, and or work with us to undo the damage that has been done to us. And, you know, let's look at them statistics and let's live in, a, in an Irish society uh, and allow us to be proud and dignified of the people that we are. We preserved everything that was good about Irish culture. Um, I think certain people need to uh, acknowledge that and um, that we actually create our own businesses and that we're able to live in cultural appropriate accommodation and cultural appropriate accommodation is, is you know, it might be different for man as what it might be for me but I'm going to give you an example of what that actually looks like in South Tipperary, I know I shouldn't name an area but the house was burnt down a couple of years ago because these set of people who were in a, who were very powerful positions and are pillars of Irish society 
and they didn't want to have a slither. So anyway, they burnt the house down, the council renovated the house and the family moved in. Um, last month, the family decided that they were going to leave because of all the bullying. And um, the local authority actually got the, the Traveller family to sign a tenancy agreement that they actually would not um, keep horses or animals or whatever. So they made them, you know, despicable or in a position that they actually couldn't stay mm -hmm. in the house. And in the end, the people that were in the powerful position, which were the settled community, actually they won and the travellers actually had to leave. So we actually don't have any cultural appropriate accommodation in Irish society. What we actually have is concentration camps of travellers uh, moving into mainstream houses. So and yet every second person in Ireland, uh, the council authorities will have provide for their homes to have a dog or a cat, as that's yeah. appropriate culture. On the thirty first of January this year, there was a Supreme Court ruling. Um, George mm -hmm. George Hogan, I believe his name was, on the McDonough case in Ennis, right. where the family had taken a case because they were being evicted uh, from public property because they were living in mobiles, mm -hmm. yeah. and the council wasn't recognising them mm -hmm. as legit homes. Now remember when we talk about homes, it was the English who defined a home as a house, yeah. mm -hmm. and it did that pretty much. In America, elsewhere, anywhere that was living in nomadic huts or rounded kind of movable homes were not classed as um, residents, they were classed as nomads. This is where this, this term nomadic traveller comes mm. up from because most of our people had farms, houses, and castles. Yeah, sure. um, so, this notion that we always travel the road mm. is not very true because you go past the 1600s, it was very normal to travel in a Gaelic society, That's it was a semi nomadic place. Um, but that uh, court ruling um, mentioned that these people who have been fighting for 100 years for ethnicity and recognition have been running into issues with the state from the formation of the state. So he didn't say it in plain words, but this was something we had already been fighting and mentioning going over. Is what he was saying, without saying it, was that in 1922, there was no change of any of the institutions or the legal acts or anything. Now, some people said you were inherited these systems. We said, no, you weren't. You were fostered yeah. into them for generations. So you had no choice but to keep them. So that was the big issue. He was almost saying that these English colonial systems and laws were hampering the native culture. Now, we want to make ourselves into a freak group. We know the native Irish speakers are very closely related and connected to ourselves. They're also indigenous people. But they, <coughs> but they live in a settlery environment. They don't get shit if you're living in a house. It's only when you move away from a house and go from place to place, place you get issues. So I suppose the vision, really short, is to say that I'm hoping one day that we get over past this because if people unlock the Irish history, I promise you will unlock some of the most complex issues on the yeah. planet when it comes to racism, mentioned to Ukrainian. Um, the Ukrainian situation is no different from all Ireland. What Russia is doing now is no different from what England had once did to this country. Yeah. It comes from an old European colonial brainwashed imperial mentality that they think it's almost natural. Now what do the colonials do all over the world? Other people. Call yeah. them tribes. Call them savages. Call them this, that and the other. And they've not done anything different when it came to Irish travellers. Yeah. We were othered in front of everybody. Literally, yeah, we're people like were ashamed to come near us because the blunt of it, yeah. hanging with the tinkers. Yeah. Now, I go back to James Condit briefly again because when people say there's no written history, um, you go to um, Walter W. B. Yeats, who had written about the tinkers. Oh. His brother Jack Yeats, who hung around that. with the tinkers, lived with the tinkers in Sligo and Longford and painted paintings. But for one reason or another, no travellers know this because we were kept away from that. And the Irish settled, too ashamed to admit that they still used the English systems and had called themselves the Irish, other thoughts, and they did kept us away from this Irish. So in other words, ye guys were telling the settled people that you came from this place and that place and this place and that place. And that was getting people thinking. Because I know a lot of people here, no fault of anyone, didn't know half the stuff we're saying, but would have never known it. For every intentional purpose, you walked around in Ireland thinking this was the default Irish mode. But the truth is, it hadn't changed since the 1600s. Now, we don't want to overthrow the system. We don't want rebellions, because we don't need that. 
We're this week, do we need a rebellion for everyone? Ready, we need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. Yes, we do. Take the barriers to the board. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion for every child is on the road. We need a rebellion about less wars all over the world, and he covered quite a bit. And I'm inclined to agree. I think it came because of the internet, the connections and people were making, because that's the only place I could ever get my education. And up to that point, I was literally suicidal, because I couldn't hack it anymore. There was nowhere I could talk to, there was no one to... You have these feelings up wrapped inside you, thinking, this can't be right. This is normal. You've got some, God forgive me, some idiot uh, lecturing you on something, and you're looking at them and saying, my God, you can, you know, you. I don't want to make things like that sometimes. But just, just on that thing, there's a few things always come to my mind about even when I say even very much the Western world and all that. It's just even back in the day when, and it's even, in, I was trying to find, um, one of my favourite films is Gone with the Wind, always a classic around Christmas time. It's four hours when you're sick after your whole eating. It's a four hour <laughs> movie and no one disturbs you. And it's, uh, frankly, my darling, I can't give you a damn and all that. But I was trying to find that film here, I think it was last year for my daughter, because I tried to let my kids watch what I watched when I was growing up. And they banned that movie because they don't want um, the, about the, the whole Negro whole thing and all that. And the Western world right, have a thing about changing things. They banned that movie because they said it was discriminatory against... I didn't know like, yeah, they banned it from not, uh, of, um, streams and all that. And then I started looking for Roots. Roots, I grew up looking at Roots. And then I was thinking, if that's the case, they're going to gonna wash away all the history about the black people that went on from yeah. back in the day. Why? Then the next stage now they're going to... Take away Schindler's List and all about the Holocaust and all about the, the, the Anne Frank story because I'm finding this world, our Western world, we have a way about a painting over all the little dirty little things that we're doing in the world. It's like that, that man died as a, as a traitor to this country. There's an awful lot of people died as traitors to this country and, and then now we're, we're celebrating them as heroes, like Eamon de Valera and all that kind of thing. Then he became the first Taoiseach. So it's how we are able to evolve in a country, in a world, shall I say, not even about us, we've got whitewashed out of society, all our history, because it, it fits into the norm of the Western world. It's like even the war in Ukraine, that whole war is going on. But, and that's getting televised and all that, and yet there's, there's that many wars going on right around the whole world, but people, because it's not fitting into our yeah, own mainstream you're talking about of movies. the world. You're talking about movies. I'm talking about the way yeah, we yeah, think no, as a people. No, you're right. But we the Western world, the yeah. white thinking, people think, next thing they're going to take away everything to do with history. That any bad history ever happened. I didn't see Sorry, one second. Yeah. We're talking again. Very, I've seen a hand raised up there. Who was there? You. Sorry. How are you? <laughs> as I said, we chat for Ireland up here. Excuse us. I just think uh, the, the film The Feed. She was going to ask a question. That's worse than Gone with the Wind. They were mocking tinkers. They had stone the walls. Field. And yes. the English... Uh, yeah. Setting everybody, this is the normal. Kill each other over the field. Well, I want. I like the other film with the other thing with the man dying. Four hours because you're having lunch. No, the other one where, the, where the, she ends up. She getting. What's the thing about the guy that comes in? He was working for the army, and the woman was having the affair with the the English soldiers. An old film as well. I don't know. Oh that. God, it's a deadly film. I think it was so sad, so tragic. And all that. Oh, Anyhow, really watching that movie. <laughs> Ryan's daughter. That's it. I like it. See, Ryan's daughter. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I like that film. <laughs> Um, I was born in Australia, and um, but my people were Irish, and so I guess one thing that I experienced in Australia was the uh, colonisation, and I was always um, disgusted at the way that um, the uh, Indigenous Australians are treated, which is exactly the same way that you guys are treated, and, and yeah. you know in terms of the conditions that you guys are living in, and um, and the discrimination you're getting, it looks very similar to the white Australians and basically I went on my own journey to try and find my own cultural heritage, Gaelic heritage and it started off with the Irish language and, and into the Gwaltocht but also it's now coming to the um, Irish traveller community and for me I see like both the Gwaltocht and the Irish traveller community as leaders, like you guys are the ones that can take me back to the culture that I'm really looking for and that I connect with that is lost otherwise in so white Australian culture where it's very um, colonial, very English. And um, so, yeah, so I, I think about James Connolly and I think, well, you know, what would have been his vision if he survived and he actually, like, he had a good relationship with, with the traveller community and knew who you guys were. And, you know, he's, he's written that history. Like, we have that. We know that, you know, 
Oh, yeah, GP is tired for the English in this room. Very English in this room. I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I will give the English an awful hard time, I apologise. Oh, yeah, but it's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> you took over the world and you just done things. The English aristocracy, it's like English empire. But you know how that works, don't you, in terms of we say the English? We're not against the English. It's stuff, yeah. uh, and even then, you will find a lot of great English people throughout the centuries. It comes down to government, and then it comes down to three branches of that, which is the religious order and the privateers. And if you go back to Rome, that was Christianity, the military, and the privateers. So that kind of spread throughout Europe. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just wondering, you were saying about kind of growing up in Ireland, growing up in England, is there any difference in the way that travellers are treated in the Republic of Ireland in terms of, uh, compared to Northern Ireland yeah. over the past 100 years? And has the border actually played a role uh, in, separate, in creating any sort of separation? For the little bit I know, there may be people here that have lived yeah. there, but I would say that Northern Ireland and England were the first to recognise travellers as uh, an ethnic minority yeah. and with an indigenous culture, or an um, ethnic culture, whatever language we're using. In the southern part of Ireland, they went to extraordinary lengths to block, stop, cut down, chop down every move of uh, Irish travel. In 1989, they actually came up with an act, which is a kind of bonkers one when you think about it. Well, they called it the Anti-Hatred Act. Now, you imagine the anti-racism and the anti-bullying, but the anti-hatred. So they had recognised there was that much hatred against travellers, vigilante mobs, yeah. burning down houses, attacking old women, afraid of diseases coming into their... All the stuff you see in Mississippi, Alabama on television was happening here in the 80s and the 90s oh, yeah. with Irish travellers. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, psychologically, I think they did a little bit better. Because no, they're a see, bit more the, thing, the, the thing about living... I lived in England and most of my father's... Not that my father's people live up in Belfast, as they call it up in Belfast. They're, you're going, we're going out to the free state, and that's what they always called up there, and I was always fascinated. My parents never brought me to Belfast for some reason. I just get very Republican when I go up to that end of the thing. And, just, and I love England, I love going to England, I love all, but it's something about the different crossing the borders, just that's another whole spectrum for me. Anyway, I get very, all that kind of stuff up me. But when I lived in England, and one thing, we lived around, we lived, we, my parents would have a big family of girls and hooligans that we wore anyhow, and really very passionate about our culture and all that. But to us, we were just Irish, but the majority of the English people, we were Irish people. Irish, right. And we were, if, if you got into trouble in England, it was because you were Irish. But there were certain areas then, the likes of Kilburn, Wilson, Harra, that's predominantly run, run by Irish people that were running business in the likes of them areas. But yeah. You, yeah. Um, you couldn't go, there's only certain pubs, you went in, there was an Irish barman. Because I remember my parents used to always say, you can't go to that pub, there's an Irish man working in there, now he's a bad man. He wouldn't, he wouldn't serve the travellers. Mm. He'd, be he he'd, be, he'd be able to identify the travellers. Yeah. But the supermarkets, if you, if you walked up to a supermarket, there was an Irish person. For example, I went to school, Brentford School for Girls. The parents didn't let me mix with boys and all that. They said I was too boy, blah, blah, blah. And I remember there was an Irish teacher teaching us um, history and all that. And I didn't know she was actually making fun of me. I didn't know like she was actually... Do you know, she was being, like, being bitchy. Like, I was in secondary school, mm. and I was in first or second year. Uh, my mother would have been a feisty woman anyhow, God bless her, she, she still is, um, thank <laughs> God. And I remember she, she, me and my sister were like Irish twins, so my mother put her age back to keep us in school together, in classes together, as most of the Irish mummies done anyhow. And she was like, are you your cousins now, and you lived here, did you live in the campsite? And we were like, yeah, we, like, we didn't live in the campsite, but my parents would have and all that, and just thinking, oh, do you get married to cousins and all that? Sure, I didn't think that, no, but we came back and start chatting to mummy as I was doing, and, I said, Mammy, I said, uh, they're asking the wee cousins, and, and are you and daddy cousins, Mammy, and all that? Well, by golly, did she, she said, the next morning, she went into that school, Brentford School, I'll never forget it. Where's the staff room, she said. Well, I can't think of the teacher name, what name and shame, or anyhow, but she's Irish. Mammy, she's not teacher Irish, she said, so she is Mammy, actually. She's uh, from Cork, I think, Mammy. Didn't think that, no, but she, she said. But what my mother told her outside the school thing, she, I left Ireland, she because of this behaviour, she said, how dare you, she said. The discriminated against my children, but the other English teachers were shocked that this teacher, I think she got suspended after it, because my mother calmed down and explained to the principal what she was saying to me, she was being blatantly discriminated and being smart to me because she was an Irish teacher, so she knew we were, we were travellers, we didn't think that of us, it was only when you were disclosed to the Irish people in, in when I think about it, the Irish people are known to be the friendliest people in the world, <laughs> and yet to do this, because for, you know in, what was it, Yonkers in New York, yeah. if you go to some pubs in Yonkers in New York, they will not serve travellers, in New York, I've been to Yonkers in, in a couple of times and 
the comparative with the money have but and I remember going in thinking now I'm in America and I remember my sister was like Maggie can't go in there they won't serve you if there's Irish bar staff there they just won't have us why is that? I feel I should be crying or something <laughs> I feel depressed go back to the fun part of my culture but that's the difference of it but in the UK you would not be discriminated against only if you do something Let's bar you come across an, an Irish person most of them, not all of them, not all bad I think you find that regularly yeah. in say, yeah. Australia, yeah. America, yeah. they yeah. actually do not see the racism and the hatred and the dislike and the contentment mm. before them. The it's only when you're on the outside, you're looking in saying, you can't be doing that's wrong, that's racist. Yeah. They don't see it. Same mm. as Ireland. And again, I feel sorry for a lot of people because they grew up and there was travellers forced to park in their front gardens. There was travellers mm. forced into angry issues that boiled over and they may have experienced it. And that went on for a while. So it's difficult to blame any side when the state, for the last hundred years, knew damn well what they were doing. They were going to keep our identity as the new Irish settlement, who were once Anglo-Saxon, who were once proud England. Not against any of these people or their labels or their identities, but they robbed our identity. This guy here died for our culture. And there hasn't been a mention of it till we're talking about it now. So that will tell you how the psyche of the island of Irish people has been almost wiped. Yeah, but I think... Would you say there's some more questions from... A question, sorry, sorry, Paul, is my... A bad chair, aren't I? Sorry now. Go on. Sorry, yes? And then, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 first you've had your hand Sorry, apologies. Yeah, I, I'd like to... Uh, first of all, I'm Mary, and uh, I'm originally from North Kerry, even though we don't like to mention places. But I'd like to know, at what stage did the halting sites actually start? Maybe, maybe you might be able to tell me. And also, because my memories of the campsites at the top of our road are so vivid and so uh, wonderful. I mean, I'm not saying that out of any, uh, it's, it's not aspirational, should I put it that way. Mm. Mrs. O'Brien came to our house with a basket of what she was selling. Mm. Her husband came to mend the milk, mm. uh, the milk buckets. Mm. And to solder them, I don't know what solder meant, but that's what it was. It was a, and uh, I just want to know at what stage, because this was the early sixties, mm. uh, late fifteen nine early sixties, mm. because I I would have left uh, Kerry in 60, 67, 68, around that time. But uh, all my childhood, I mean, my aunt used to say, uh, Mrs. O'Brien, when she brought my aunt in the village, would say. Uh, your 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 uh, your brother up uh, uh, up in Dunkaha, he'd give you this shirt off his back, and my my aunt used to say, I no wonder he would in the journey you had to get in to see him inside because it was a long avenue. Mm. But our relationship is a completely different one. What I'm hearing mm-hmm. tonight, so I, that open was the breakdown, the real breakdown when when we established was it. Dublin or suburban Dublin or what was it? Because I certainly as far, as far as I know from what older shabs would tell me. In the 1960s, uh, 1963, um, there was a tourist industry happening in Ireland. I don't know if this is true or not. And then that's when they didn't want travellers living at the side of the road, being nomadic people, and they said that they were going to absorb traveller people into Irish society and assimilate them. Now, Bernard, you might have yeah. more knowledge, or Mags might have more knowledge, but that's, that's the much kind of stuff yeah. that all the travellers would have told me, that then there was very good um, settled people with, you know, with really good intentions of drawing up then uh, Halton sites for us. There was, there and, was and politically then where we were, we were actually captured was we were actually at the edges of a city next to dumps or pylons and definitely out of sight and out of mind and there was big grey walls built around us. But also there's a, there, around that same time because my parents now and all the old school travellers and the settled people had very good relationships with travellers. What happened in the 1960s and I might read a few books about this but my mother would have, there's a people going around called the the, the people who used to take the children the other way used to cruelty, I always thought that was a, just, people used to say that to cruelty they used to go around and they used to take the kids Check and, 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 take, and they took an awful lot of traveling children and an awful lot of women were put into the laundries and things like that. Mm. And then the, the Irish society, they, set, they start giving out social welfare payments and things like that. And the travellers got very fearful because the children, the cruelty people come around to take the children. So the government they threatened, up, they, they threatened, they threatened them an awful lot. They threatened travellers either to move into, into these little 
they have camps and they'll be safe and then you have people up the village and they give you proper food and then the crew, the people won't come near you. So when they start putting travellers into the sites and build up these little walls, it broke down. It meant settling travellers think they were different because everyone lives side by side very harmoniously. So my parents said the same thing and they helped each other out and they lived and they moved down and whatever and they'd all be, you get this and all that. But it happened by building these little sites that the government thought was going to keep travellers nice and tidy in there and travellers had the fear that the children, the cruelty man, was going to come around and take I think, what you, I think what you said, Mary, yeah. was travellers did traditionally have a very good relationship with yeah. certain oh, people. Did, yeah. And right. in terms of our living, uh, you know, our um, mortality rates and our statistics were very, very different in the 1963s to now. Um, it was quite you know, our age, yeah. we lived till the 80s and 90s, you know. We, were, we lived longer, yeah. our previous generations lived longer. Yeah. But uh, there was quite a few things going on around that time in the 1960s. Um, I think America was still sewing up all the deals yeah. they took over from England uh, just after World War II. Um, that's why you see so many American bases throughout even Shannon and throughout the world. They were previous English dominions and in some, part, some regards. There was also... Um, the 1960s, uh, the Americans, uh, JFK had come to Ireland, but prior to that, it would have been a very prom- a Protestant-led Dublin. They would have covered all of the merchant business. So feeling the fall wanted something different. So they linked with the Americans and become very Americanized. Um, JFK in 1963 was in Ireland, but yeah. before he left America, 10 days in around that, uh, Martin Luther King, in 1963, which is a wonderful year, which is one of the documentaries I'd love to do. But Martin Luther King in 1963 was waiting on a Supreme Court ruling to end segregation in America for African Americans. Right. Malcolm X in Berkeley 1963 was saying the same thing. He was saying he was sick and tired of listening to even fellow black Americans in the NGOs, saying that nothing had changed for a hundred years. So at the same time, JFK was on his way to Ireland while these people were waiting for a court, which these people, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, were disappointed that the president of the country couldn't have waited in to find out the Supreme Court ruling. Now, when JFK gets to Ireland, a few weeks afterwards, they launched the 1963 Commission Report into itinerancy, which was a forced assimilation project, which was a replicate of uh, uh, King Henry's uh, uh, 1600s settlement of Ireland. No difference, almost word for word in um, most regards. This is what they were doing in the 1963 report. They would say to the Travers family, you're being moved left, right and centre yeah. because they brought laws in the 1940s to keep moving people. So they were moving Travers left, right and centre. And then when they had them worn down and they couldn't do it anymore, they'd say, well, now we want you to burn your wagon in front Sorry. of us. Don't give it to somebody else who's living in a tent. Don't give it to your sister, your brother. Burn it to the ground before we give you a house. In the 1980s, Dublin contacts London, asked them, how did you deal with the itinerants? Yeah. So the Irish people were asking the English people, how did they want to deal with the Irish people? So they said backwards, we put up billards, posts, yeah. these hedge grows, you know, you did come from the English. They were to stop the gales and the clans from moving. So this version, you see, these big boulders and the fences and the barriers, they came from the English in the 1980s yeah. through Dublin and spread out through the country. These things have happened, we can't undo a lot of them. There's so much we can do. And that's about opening up and sharing. Because the people you've mentioned are Irish as Irish could ever be. They've been there centuries, thousands of years. The only thing that divides us and continues to divide us is this language. This misunderstanding how this language is even used. It was constructed out of other languages 1500 years ago. It was used for trade and systems and dealings and profits, which might explain the Western American mentality in the global economy. It's very businesslike. Look at Ireland. Everybody's suited up. Everybody wants to be the top of the best. And every institution, every college, every school tells every child to be the best they can, top of the class, put your hand up, success. Um, and reach for the world and grab the world and conquer this and conquer that. That is what the Western world is telling their children every single day. And everybody becomes an individual. Nobody becomes a community or family anymore. So this is why we're having all these issues. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm sorry, you have a question there, that lovely girl there. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind if I just talk for a minute. I was wondering if you could have background to why I'm asking the question because I think it'll help. Um, yeah, no problem. 
So I'm from Winslow Time. Um, in my primary school, there were some traveler girls and stuff. Um, my parents used to take us and make more of things about the travelers in my community. My mom was a teacher in my school as well, and she had traveler girls in her class. And she would say these really awful things about them. And everyone I knew used to always say these things, and it was just, it seemed completely normal when I was growing mm -hmm. up. Yeah. And then I went to this really posh Dublin school like in the Carpines. And when the Carpines fire happened, um, the things that I heard people saying, and um, like politicians, which is from Adam, saying about travellers, part of me felt like it was wrong, but it also felt kind of normal because of how we yeah. brought up with it. Conditioned. And it wasn't, and like, I, I remember there were a few points where like conversations about travellers had come up throughout college and stuff, and people go, oh yeah, it's really terrible how you're reading. And go, oh yeah, that's really terrible. But I knew to again, all these people had the exact same up as me, and I've heard all these things and never actually stopped to properly think about it other than just to kind of soothe their own mm -hmm. mind to go, oh yeah, no, that's awful, I don't condone that. But they're the ones in these communities and holding this up. And then when I went, um, I. <laughs> I was on point for a little bit and one of my friends is an artist and she said the National Gallery or National um, Museum of um, Design, whatever, the one in the arts, um, is they're doing a kind of workshop on cleaning pockets. And I never would have known anything about and I'm not an artist um, and I never would have done anything other than it was two weeks and I was unemployed and I thought it seemed interesting. Um, and I went and it was about 20 traveller women and about 20 second women and we were learning about the beanie, po uh, the beanie pockets mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of significance and like some parts of the country have like, different meaning of the stitches and we were seeing like, like they are an example of one of them, like someone's grandma, there's one and they're passing around and I had this really horrible feeling of oh my god, like everything that I've thought about and everything I've heard like it's just like you were saying like about like seeing the illusion switching and stuff like I had that kind of moment and I went and I read about it loads but I'm still kind of resistant to talking about it with people I promise I'm getting to a question <laughs> um, I was still kind of resistant to talking about it because I had so much shame around and I still do like this kind of shame of like I've been complicit in this and the, this system like you know you can say that it's not the individuals and it's the system but the system's is made yeah, up the <laughs> and like you know so and then whenever I've talked like you know anytime travelers have kind of come up in conversation then I've had a feeling of like now I've seen the other side I actually have a bit of a duty to say something but I can tell that people aren't actually really listening because they haven't had an experience where they've seen it and they'll hear what I say like, oh yeah no geez that's terrible all about that but yeah. I know that they're not actually understanding it and what I've seen when we were talking about the Black Lives Matter movement um, and what I've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement is lots of people saw it yeah. and there was that switch and then you get people, like not black people, and people from British communities actually taking part. That's and I correct. Don't, for the, ever since I did that Beauty Pocket project and like, I've read more about it and stuff, I've been wondering like how could I get involved in something trying to make people see the switch but I don't, I, I don't really see an easy answer to it and I was wondering. This is the question. Um, <laughs> How do you see that switch happening? And I know it's really unfair to put this on travellers to go like, people have been awful to you, how do you think that they'll be happy enough and less shame for themselves to actually do something to help? But what is, are there any kind of practical things you wish several people would know, or is there something you wish you get across? Did you? So I just want to yeah. say, what's your name? Sarah. So I have to say, you have, you have really put a look in the middle exactly what, exactly what's happened. Every single day with the second community as their children, not your fault. You haven't been brought up to a system, haven't been brought up to everything. And it's not an individual, and I've always said this people out here are not very, very bad people. They're just grown up as a system that's being taught as a young child, blah, blah, blah. You've hit everything in a nutshell for me. That's exactly what Irish society is with travellers. And how to change it is exactly something like that because no one's going to say come into a house and learn about the travel, but they're going to be still fearful. But it's an experience like that, it's one person like that to even change in a room of people is, is, um, it it's, so, it's so important for everyone. There so, was an experiment yeah. years ago, I've seen it was called, well, you would have seen it, it was yeah. called the blue eyes, brown eyes, yeah. Um, yeah. where they told the blue eyes that the brown eyes were superior yeah. for one week and the blue eyes yeah. were failing and they were feeling down and were getting beaten up and she switched it. So that to me was always a case of the power of a teacher and an institution yeah. that could do that to children. So it was an experiment, but a powerful one. That is no different from what the state did with the settled people, the normal people, the law-abiding citizens and their travellers. 
And they projected the travellers as gangsters and bad people and be fearful of them. Don't talk to them. Don't even let them near you. And that's it. How do we see it changing? You can go through your whole life being angry and pissed and being raged. I've went through that enormous amounts of it. And it's only one day, like you go through life one day, something can happen. It changes everything that once happened. Everything you ever felt upon, everything you see, now you see it different. So if you see it different, you feel it different. I truly believe, true trial vision, that we're going to bring, not back Gaelic revival, because we are Gaelic survivalists. We're going to bring back the arts, and we're going to slightly embarrass the state, that if you are the proud Irish people that you say you are for the last 100 years, and you are celebrating 100 years of independence, could you please explain to us why Irish travellers have been persecuted and driven into the ground with <coughs> English colonial systems that you say don't exist. And I think when we do a bit of that, there might be a bit of tweaking in the systems because like, we're half a rebellion, all right? We don't want a full rebellion, we'll take a half of one. <laughs> but just, can, I, can I just say from my experience, uh, being involved in the NGO sector or whatever, and what I find is you have a senior civil servant that has probably been there for years and with different political parties mm -hmm. that come into government constantly. And the one department that is constantly resistant is the Department of Education. Wow. And, you know, at the National Travel Roma Inclusion Strategy in terms of consultation or whatever, they see themselves as, we don't have a problem, it's she are the problem. So what they actually do to our children is they constantly tell them that they're, uh, you know, they can't be educated, um, they're dirty, they're stupid, they're ignorant. Even if you look at where travel children are situated scientifically in a classroom, most travel children are situated at the back of the classroom. And used, and that, are used as a mechanism yeah, and to tell the set of children, if you're bold, You'll sit beside the dinker and, and you will learn fast. And then they'll take the travel <laughs> children God, they're doing that for long time. at the age of four. I think I inspired them. And actually, people. you know, give them resources so to tell them. So what actually happens psychologically, the child tells them, I'm not as clever as a settled child. There's something wrong with me because I'm a traveller. So the travel child actually internalised that and it's drip, drip, drip. And what is actually happening? Not all teachers, but the teachers that would have taught me, you know, would have been, it was very kind of in your face, but whereas now it's indirectly subtle. and it's very, very subtle, subtle. Very but it's drip, drip, drip. But one thing about our kids, they're so intelligent that they actually find a strategy of being able to get expelled very fast, very quick. There's two, you know, there's two departments yeah. in Ireland, actually two, two state that agencies that only deal with travellers. One is the Criminal Justice Department. Oh, you're, talking, you're talking about apartheid systems in South Africa. Here's Irish travellers with apartheid systems, acts and laws in place and nobody can see them. People want to talk about racism in America and they can't see it there. People want to talk about oppression. Now there's not just that, but the two departments that deal with travellers yeah. is the Department of Justice and the National Health Board. Yeah. Where are travellers today dropping dead and in prison, overrepresented? So and that's what through we get by Ireland. We, I meant me to talk about, just to say that, and, and I have to even say it myself, because as grown up as a traveller myself, you can get very bitter and get very horrible, and you can get very downhearted, and you, get, you can go against the world. Mm -hmm. And I can see exactly what you're saying, because when you look at an individual person, no matter what you're, when you're brought, brought up to something and you don't know any different, it's very hard to know the difference of changes. That's exactly, it's only when it's actually put into your face. Mm -hmm. And I've always said to my children, and, and thank God, thankfully you've done that, is that, you can't change the world, no. but you can change a person. But because I've asked that many people would me, and if I met a settled person for the first time, they're like, do you know what to say? Like you're you're so different. Like you're you show me your travel mags. Like you show, and I'm like, yeah. Like I've never met a traveller before. Like I said, do you, do you think they've never once turned around and said? Because I've often asked them, do you dislike me now because I'm a traveller? And they've never come around and said, Sorry, yes. Sorry. They've never said no. They've never not like me because chair, of chair, chair. Yes, exactly. <laughs> chair. <laughs> Chatty chair. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. In connection with what that, that lady was saying and what you're talking there in terms of represent the importance of representation. Um, I think I think advertising and marketing it has a huge effect on me in terms of introducing a normalizing 
various different people. Ireland's a more diverse, slightly more diverse place than it used to be, and that's very much reflected in our advertising. Yes. And yet, you never see, I've never seen the traveller in an ad. That's right. Um, in terms of normalising, you know, seeing inside people's homes what they eat, what they want, what they aspire to, right. which is what advertising is about. Have travellers been approached by advertising agencies, or 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 you know, no. or would they? Or would they be I would have always loved to go to acting and go on at the driving yeah. school and go on out to Diet Coke advertise but to be the handsome guy with a I don't want you I want, but they never know they would they would never come in. The only way they want to go in around the sites is that there's something anti social and going around in the area and they want to but never in a positive light. It's in terms of di- diversity and in, and yet no. it's excluded from the diversity agenda of the But even if you look say, well, when you say diversity you oh, sorry, when you say diversity you mean settle people t- not settle people, yeah. people but people yeah. think of diversity. Sure. What do you think? Well sure in terms India, of people, Japan, yeah. China, yeah. Africa yeah. the continent they don't think about white people. Yeah. And this is the concept that we're getting into so much trouble mm-hmm. about when people believe that racism is colour-coded. Mm-hmm. It was in the 1600s, 17th century in America through the English linguistics to justify slavery. But to say that Irish people were not victims of racism is an understatement. Yeah. Because when you think about it, um, they were calling them white chimpanzees. They were referring to them to animals and vermin. For a lot of the people today, unfortunately, we're not getting this message crossed because it's psychologically blocked. If you look at Ireland in general, in general, with settled people, all peoples, it's got an 18.5 percent higher depression rate than almost the rest of Europe. It's got a higher suicide rate in general. So that means the whole island has got a whole lot of trauma, and nobody's talking about it. Nobody wants to talk about Sorry, it. Sorry, just say, I have a hand up there, and then I think I have to wrap things up. I just, I just, I applaud what you're doing tonight because you're in this program. But don't you think there's time now for um, to showcase like maybe a traveller museum I totally uh, agree. Or, and or a traveller week where you're doing exactly what you say here yeah. an Irish traveller history, history, culture and movement we, actually, we, yeah. have, we have traveller pride Traveller Pride Week happens in June, actually, every year for the last few years. I think, yeah. Castle Bar have a Traveller I think, I think, uh, and uh, this is because we're having also looking at Traveller History Month, right? But what you're hearing here now has never come from a travel organisation. It never came from a state department. What you're hearing now has come from the traveller and the traveller community. We weren't nurtured, we weren't educated, we weren't encouraged to come up with this. We found it ourselves and we figured it out ourselves without a settled education. So I would say with the NGOs, all the millions that have been spent over the years have still negatively, psychologically impacted on travellers. Because there is a narrative that we're some kind of freak, ethnic minority that nobody's ever heard of. They're ignorant. And despite the fact, but unfortunately some travellers got drawn into that we, themselves. Just to, to again, just me again being back chair, and just to say, and I, I do, and it's like, like to these events, because you're right, we need to showcase our towns, we have an awful lot of talents out there, it's brilliant. But I applaud the likes of these events because the likes of the people that has never met a traveller engage yeah, with a traveller and that can break down and ask. As I always say to people, they say, like, I'm afraid to ask a question, but if you don't ask a question, I don't care how insulting it is. If you don't ask a question, we're not all perfect here. We aren't being brought up, I haven't been brought up that women are spo- men are supposed to be up here and women are supposed to be down here. Never going to wash up me, like, no. I'm supposed to be here, that I'm supposed to have good friends and settle people because that's the way it works. We have to go as individuals and learn to let live and let people express their own individuality, their own cultures, their own ethnicities, and that's the way life should be. And I find the Western world is crap at that. Through the chair, can I just, just say, yes, the chair, the I think you have to wrap up. The back chair. Mm-hmm. Yes. That lady, Sarah, I think, and I'm from the settled mm-hmm. community myself, I'm a born bred settled woman, myself Irish. I think what you can do is, it's not name and shame, because you don't want to shame your parents, none of us do. But what you can do is challenge your parents, challenge mm-hmm. their perceptions, mm-hmm. then talk about what you've learned through your life. And then it's changing, and it's changing that sees. That man there was shot with a gun, wasn't he? Am I right or wrong? <laughs> it was beaten up and then shot, you know. Because of what? Well, he was dying for Gaelic principles. Exactly. Not, not because dying. he stood for unions what are travellers or dying working for? class. Because what, are tra- what are travellers dying for? Sorry? Why, why are travellers dying? Because the same colonial exactly. systems have never changed. What's the weapon they're used now? Uh, they're gone. Psychological exactly. warfare. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, listen, I will say one more thing. Yes, just to get to the So when you leave, when you leave here, when you leave here, you will understand. When we say settled, we are not talking about persons, individuals. We're talking about environment and institution. And settled itself is only a construct, no more different than traveller, tinkers, itinerants, all them neighbours. 
Dim neighbors were born out of English colonization, not against the English, Scottish, Ooh, Protestants, or Catholics. Okay, but what we're saying <laughs> is that we need to do a psychological reset. So thank you to Aaron Nolan for inviting us here. Yes. I'm really delighted for that. And I hope we I hope you got something from it. And, uh, <laughs> This travel I mean, man lives longer because he understands the It's like those oh, yeah. um, It's like these events, and you, our email addresses, you get them off the guys up there, and if you want to ask any questions or invite us to any other events or to schools, work environments, or anything like that that you need or to ask. Event. Or even, oh yes, on the 20th of July, Southside Travels Action Group in Sandyport, we have an annual cultural yeah. event, um, music, oh, be brilliant. Now, yes. we never ran the last two years because of COVID, but it's coming back up this year as the 28th. It's an evening event. It's it's brilliant. Invitation. It's an open invitation. More than welcome to come to us. 28th of July. Now we've had a few, a lot of good people. This is the first there. time here, everybody. As yes. I said, you're not invited, <laughs> Bernard. It's going to be always happening. But it's things like yeah, that, and to meet people individually, because we all have fears about no matter what walks of life people are, and it's just yeah. breaking down the instilled things that we have as individuals. And as we grow up as children, the whole lot, as I said, we're all rebels in our own right space. Take your parents if they're still alive. But thank you so much. I think that's it now. <laughs> can I just say one? Oh, can I just nice. give one other piece of information, please? On the 31st of Four May, hours. we'll actually be having um, a <laughs> demonstration outside the doll from 12 right. to 2. Okay. And it's around politicising mental health and the suicide rates and the root yeah. causes of it. So if yeah. you could support us, yeah, we'd really appreciate it. And also we have a website up, trapvisionfoundation.com. <laughs> and if you go no, to the contact yeah. page and fill in the form, we're having a mini a mini rebellion starting from Sligo. Uh, and we're working I, I, with I, I, And I would just like to all to thank you so much for attending this lovely event. <laughs> Thank you.